Okay. Everyone has their chart. We're going to do some element stuff today. Okay. But before we start, I put three words on the board. What do these have in common? What do they mean to you in respect to psychology, clients, mental health? What comes up? Well, they all have a meaning and purpose, and they're kind of intertwined. Okay, and what would their meaning and purpose be in a therapeutic session? Yeah. Table symbols. Okay. Table symbols. Okay. They're so all symbols. You can, yeah, you can like something meaningful to the person, or you can tell them about um, certain symbols and how they can help them. Absolutely. And then the elements like there, it's water, fire, into air, to the one earth. earth. Yeah. So. Um, you, I guess you can have a relief to Okay. To see how they relate to Okay. And then metaphors, they're just like you're, I don't want to say comparing, but like a metaphor is, it's the same as a symbol or element, it's just in mm -hmm. a written way. Okay. But it's in a deeper wording. meaning. Yeah, exactly to what is just said at face value. Yeah. Okay. So I have this up here, language of the site. And this is just in addition to, it's all the same. Myth, one of the reasons why I teach with myth and use myth is because there are no new stories. This is very important that you understand. There are no new stories. Every story that your client is living, every story that you are living, your life story. The other day I was with someone in the, and she says to a friend of her, a, a new friend she met, she's like, oh, do you know my story? And I just thought that was really interesting because she was about to share her story about her marriage and her ex-husband and this and this, and we all have a story. That's how we communicate with other people. So if we can identify, and a client is just living a story, and we can identify a story, and myth is one of the ways to do that, that's why I share those myths with you, then we can see what story they're living and we can help them change the story. Why would we want to help a client change the story? It's change the outcome. Okay, change the outcome. What else? Do it different. To do it differently. <laughs> hashtag do it differently. Yes. Okay, and if you change the story, you can change your whole life. Because if you decide one day to wake up and say, no, I don't want to live that story anymore. Today, I'm going to start living this new story. Like you said, the whole outcome changes. The person's entire life can change. You know how you said that myths, um, they don't change? Like, they're... Right, they're like consistent the throughout time so and culture. Me and my friend with my mom, we were talking about the Bible and all that stuff. And I just brought it up that all the stories in the Bible are similar to Greek mythology and like they're intertwined and my mom went off, you know, on her holiness. I'm like, okay, <laughs> All they did. <laughs> yeah, they changed the names. And they changed the name? <laughs> The location, yeah. the costume, mm -hmm. that's it. There's nothing new, no new story. Super important for you to understand. Now this does not mean that you're gonna tell your client, <laughs> oh, your story is not new. We've been living this story out for, and, and minimize perhaps you know, the importance of their life. But if you can start identifying with a story that you know, you could start hearing the similar threads. And that's why I think mythology, that's why I think astrology is so amazing. So what I do is I take the sun, I take the moon, and I take the ascending, and I find the story. 
And this is the story that the client will live out continuously. And you don't even need to know astrology. You just listen to someone and immediately you pick up on their story. Is there self-hatred? Is there narcissism? Is there depression? You know, is there a gender thing? Do men matter more? Were they disowned? Were they unloved? Were they unwanted? We pick up. That's why zero to seven is so important. Because the zero to seven gives you the actual story. What does pregnancy, birth, and conception do? Start your story. This is the real story. It started here, but the person may not know how to verbalize it. They may not know how to verbalize it because they weren't there. Well, they were there at the moment of conception, but they may not think about it. They may not even know their story of conception. They may disassociate to the pregnancy and, of course, the birth. Most people don't even think about that. But they were there for zero to seven. That's why we get the story from zero to seven, and then we go up. And we ask questions so that this all validates the story. And once you can identify it, then you can say, oh, they're just living out whatever story in the Bible, whatever story from Sumerian mythology, whatever story from Greek mythology. And you don't need to know those stories. They're wonderful to know. And the repertoire of stories are phenomenal. And that's why I bring these symbols in, and that's why I share these myths with you. But that's why we want to know myth or story. The more stories that we read, you know, ancient sort of stories, and I didn't bring my mythology Bible, but downstairs I have a mythology Bible, I have world mythology books. You see that in every single culture, it's the same story. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark comes from an old, old story of Una Pishtin from the Sumerian mythology thousands of years before. The guy's name wasn't Noah. But in the Bible, they took that story. Inanna, I've told you about Inanna, that's what my book, The Seven Gates, is based on. And that story is a story of Jesus. So it doesn't matter. We don't have to fight with a person religiously, we don't have to argue with somebody, you know, based on anything. We just have to remember no new story. And this person is simply finding a story that they identify with, oftentimes from conception, pregnancy, and birth, but they live it out with their costume, in their house, with their name. The characters are their parents, or their brothers and their sisters, or the uncle who abused them, whatever it is, and that's it. And all of a sudden, that became that person's story and their life. But if you can go upwards and find the myth, you can help your client rewrite that myth. And why is it called a myth? When we hear myth, what do we think of? Something that hasn't been proven. Exactly. Exactly. We often think of, oh, it's something made up. And these stories are made up to explain humanity. These stories are made up to explain humanity. Do I believe that a man named Jesus lived? Yes, I do. I believe there was a man who his name was Jesus, who lived in the time, and he was a model for all of us to live a better life. Easy as pie. There's the story. Is the myth that he was a virgin, birthed from a virgin mother? Probably. There's somewhat of the story that might be made up or we're not really sure about, but we take it at face value. And we all have these stories in our family. We heard about some uncle, we heard some story about our mom. We heard some story about, you know, some great grandfather. And we kind of just repeat the story and we accept it and we take it as face value. But we never proved it. And that's the beauty of using story and symbol and metaphor and myth for the client. Is that if you can identify that it's made up, they made this story up in their head. 
so that they could believe that they're a piece of shit, so they could believe that they're a bad mother, so they, they could believe that they're God on earth, so they could believe that nobody loves them, so they could believe that they're the devil. <laughs> we made it all up. And we sit there and we tell the story to ourselves over and over and over. I'm right now in such a self-destructive story, I can't even tell you. I'm unlovable, I'm hideous, I'm a Frankenstein, I'm a loser. I mean, I, my story right now, I am making love to my story. Like if it were, I mean, it's, it's pathetic and I know better. I know better, but I can't get out of it. So I go to therapy to see if my therapist can help me get out of it. It doesn't mean that I don't recognize what I'm doing. It does not mean that because you're in this field, you're not going to do this. If anything, you're probably going to do it more while you're attracted to the field. And you're going to do it knowing what you're doing. And you're doing it knowing what you're doing, which takes away a little of the joy, because it's like, fuck, at least if I was ignorant about it. You know? it, it would be a little surprising. A little bit. Just like, oh, a little great. bit. And then you have someone else call you out on it, and you're like, fuck, you can't even play dumb. No. You can't even and then you have to fix it to be the therapist for something. Right, exactly, exactly. It's like, who do I want to therapize these days? <laughs> do you think that I want to therapize anyone these days? I'm in my own wallowing story, my own melancholy, my own depression. Who the hell do I want to therapize? I just want to sit and have a misery session with people. I don't want to help you get out of your shit right now. <laughs> like, so let me we, take notes while I'm helping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll use one of these things for myself. But if we can just recognize that, it helps. And we do have to do our own inner work. We have to look at our own shit. Even if we're in depression, even if we're having a hard day, even if things in our life suck like mine do right now, we still show up to work, we still help clients. But this is a really good sort of metaphor for explaining client behavior it's just a story and there are no new stories that's where myth is phenomenal symbol is the representation and that's why i said to you today i want to start with the symbol library so today we're going to open up and see what symbol comes up and if you can hear symbol in the person's story and if you listen you will hear elements are just one symbol that you could hear you could hear a person speaking water you can hear them speaking fire. You can hear them speaking earth. You can look at them and you can see an element. Oftentimes people with red hair, whether it's chosen or whether it's natural, or have a fire element. That's something you can, a nonverbal, you can see. So you'll find the fire element in this person and that tells you something. If someone has a fire element, there's an element there of transformation. There's an element there of heat, of passion. And now you have something to work with that you can help your client. Oh, they have some fire in them. They have some passion. I just have to do the job of finding what that passion is. Like pointing it out to them. So Absolutely. They can use it themselves. Absolutely. And that's our job is just to point it out or to ask the question so that they can have the aha. Oh. The epiphany. I thought of that on my own. And our job, we ask the question for them to get to that. But if they are bleaching or dyeing their hair bright red, there's gotta be a fire element. If the person is talking about money a lot and security, finances, that's an earth element. There's some stability in that person. You can get that person to do something stable. You can, do, you can get that person to be consistent in a behavior because there's an earth element. Water, we suck. And today we'll talk about the psychological conflicts of these. It's all emotion. So are you gonna talk to the person about practical applications to a water person? Please, I don't wanna hear practical applications. Here I am teaching practical applications and I can't even do it to myself. Because I'm ah! Yesterday, one of my dear friends got a really great job. And I am so happy for him. I am so, so happy for him. Why? Because I'm feeling that if he could get out of his misery, there's a chance for me to get out of mine. 
It's a feeling. It's a water. I'm connecting as a water. That's the water person. So you can use these elements as symbols when you're working with a person. And you're exactly right. You're going to bring that element in for them to have an aha moment, or you're going to learn an application so you can speak in their language. If I go to a session, I start talking Chinese to someone, that's the same way of me talking water to an earth person. It's Chinese. Right now, there's no earth in me. I don't want to hear about stability and practicality and this will pass. Talk, cry with me. That's what I need. Water. So we have to think that this is a language that we're using with client. Ceremony ritual. I wrote this whole book called Witch Bitch that will hopefully be out soon on different mm. ceremonies and rituals or the homeworks that you could give to clients so that they can do different things, whether it's planting a tree, writing a letter, setting a, you know, something on fire. Mm -hmm. I had this one lady that I knew who used to give her clients a watermelon and have them bash the watermelon in with a knife. It's a good idea. Yeah. To get out frustration and anger. Because psychologically, the red was like blood, that they were like killing that person. And it's a watermelon, it's a hefty thing. Yeah, way to take out your frustrations, right? And that was one of the big assignments. That was one of the big ceremonies that she would do with clients. And guess what, what I would be thinking? What? You're making a yes. mess. Yes. <laughs> I was cleaning this up, I was cleaning this up. Not if you do it outside. You still gotta clean it oh, up. Because yeah. <laughs> she's an earth. Let this be a warning. <laughs> I would be thinking, oh my god, I'm killing this person, but who am I hurting in the process? Like, you know, who's getting hurt by this person getting killed or something? Like, I'm but getting hurt. You I work with yeah, exactly. <laughs> ceremony and ritual is like the homework that you can give clients. It's symbolic. So I have this one ceremony that I gave a client once where I had them go to seven different banks. And in the bank teller thing that goes up the chute, um, put in like different positive words. I don't remember exactly what this person, what their issue was, but that was the assignment that came out. And they went to seven different banks. I put this one in the book. And you put different positive words in the little thing for the teller and you shoot it up and then you leave the bank. Uh, cool. That's a ceremony. You're getting them out of their head. They're giving positive into their bank. They're giving positive into the world rather, oh, I think it was someone who was always suffering from money issues. And it was like they were gonna give positive reinforcement towards the, the, the financial uh, institution versus in, oh my God, I'm getting back money and I'm losing money and I, I never have enough on my statement. I think it was something like that. And so ceremony and ritual it's like that, and it can be as simple as lighting a candle. Every time I start a client session, I light a candle, and I light something called holy stick, because I just like the smell of Palo Santo. It's just light, and it makes the client feel at home. I go behind the client, I cleanse them, and it sets the stage that we're starting something. If you've ever gone to a yoga class, most of the time they start with Om, where they have everyone chant Om. I used mm -hmm. to own an Ayurvedic school, and that's what we would do. We would start every class with a chant of Om. It's to start something. It's to initiate the session. You can do something like that. I have these card decks. I have crystals. Sometimes I just have a client pick out a card to get a theme. There's different ways of working with the subconscious. There's different ways of initiating the session. And it makes the session feel like it's a ritual, like it's a ceremony, like this hour for the client is super important. You don't have to do mainstream things. You can have the client say one word, the first word that comes to mind, and tie that into the session. So there's different ways of using these things. So all of this is metaphor for what is going on in the client's life. 
So I have this book called Metaphors of Healing. And I'm just going to open to any page and we'll read the little anecdote. And what they are is so that therapists can learn these little metaphors and use them in session if it's relative to what the client comes from, comes for. So this one is beating negative thinking. How wonderful. <laughs> okay. The first one says, and I left my glasses. Very what if can be bad or good? We frighten ourselves with what if thoughts. What if an accident happens? What if I lose my job? What if the world is submerged in water and we all die? We scare ourselves. Statistically, the chances of bad and good events are random. Let us turn the tide around. Start replacing fearful what ifs with encouraging ones. What if my day is beautiful? What if I succeed in my business? What if I have a long and healthy life? What if I do my job well? What if I'm a safe driver? What if the world continues for another million or billion years? Until now, you have scared yourself with what bad ifs. Now make yourself happy with good what ifs. That's a simple activity that you can have your client do daily. Just one of the what ifs, they have to turn that around. Let's read another one. A lucky mindset. There are many places in a house. The choice is yours as to where you want to spend the most time. You can spend all day in the family room with sunshine, or you can spend all your time in a dark, damp closet with the trash. When we think of good times, good people, and activities that give us pleasure, we create a mental family room full of sunshine. Think of the metaphor there. We can imagine that room, people we love, the light coming in. On the other hand, we can think of all the past hurts and future fears and create a mental trash closet where we can spend all our time making ourselves miserable. There's no such thing as being cursed with bad luck or having bad luck. There is only a difference in mindset. Those who seem to live effortlessly and have good luck are those whose thoughts live in their happy mental family room. Those who feel cursed and like they have bad luck are the ones whose thoughts and perceptions live in the mental trash closet. Those are visuals. You can actually have your client draw these two different rooms or create these two different rooms in their space. You can actually create a trash closet in your office and have them walk out of that I had a client once and I gave him an assignment where he took crutches and he made like a box of crutches and he slept in that, that space. And he was like, this is miserable. And he was a really tall, thin guy. So it was really hard for him to like just sleep in that one part of the space. And I said, the reason I gave you that assignment was because I wanted you to see how much space you're living in. You're only living in the negative. You're only living in the dark. For this guy who was like 6'3", to be like crunched up for one night, just one night, sleep, you can do that with a box. Have them stay in a confined space so they can see how much limited thinking they have. When they have this entire repertoire of life, this whole world, I'm speaking for myself these days, <laughs> but you know. And we always. Yeah, exactly, and that's why we're in this field. That's why we're in this field. I had my therapist tell me that now feeling meaningless, I can bring more meaning to people's lives because I know what meaningless feels like. So especially when we're depressed, especially when we're down and out, we can do more good for others. And I swear to you that when my friend called me yesterday and told me about this job, I got so happy, so, so happy. I was just like, wow, there's, there's a positive, there's an outlook, there's something I can look forward to. I had to connect it with myself. And that's what we do with clients. That's why we share things that are relevant to share so that they can see you too got out of something. You too experienced something and you're still doing a meaningful job. This is a really meaningful job. 
It really is. It's a beautiful profession you guys chose. Because you're helping people. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's hard sometimes. Sometimes I say to my therapist, how can you sit here and listen to just bullshit all day when your life, you have problems? But how much better to be doing that when things are going bad to be listening to other people? I think it was Mother Teresa who said when you're having like, and this is a very big paraphrase, when you're having trouble or difficulty, serve others. So you picked a really beautiful profession. So symbol, myth, metaphor, elements, listening. And those are the small things we give somebody. The other day someone said, just put your shoes on backwards. If you normally put your right shoe, put your left shoe. Something so small. But that, what is the metaphor there? Try something new. Try something new. You could hashtag do it differently. Or you could do mix match socks. I've heard of that one. Okay. Different color socks to leave your comfort zone. To leave your comfort zone. Picking a different nail color. Do you know how many years I wore white on white French manicure? Years and years and years. My nail girl was like, please do something different. Nope. It was safe. But it's safe and sore. Yeah. But it's nail polish. You take it off. This is how this is how stuck we get. This is how stuck we get. You with the colors. I heard the other day you wore red. Yes. I was so I happy to hear that. And today you're wearing blue. blue. And today you're wearing blue. You're, you're wearing, wearing something goldy so that you're seen. Yep. And I remember you share about a client that came in really depressed when you were doing your training, and then she started getting dressed and stuff like that. Those are non-verbals that we're seeing a client improve. Today I wore a dress. When I first started here, I wore a dress and heels every day of the week. And then things just started going downhill. My life was falling apart and I got cancer again. And today I was like, no, wear a dress. I feel better when I'm wearing a dress and I'm wearing heels. And what's the first thing I said? She said, oh my God, you're wearing a dress. You look so pretty. That's the first thing I said. Wearing a dress. <laughs> she said, you look better today. And it's not necessarily that I'm better. I do think that my, my friend's news made me feel better. But I said, what is something that made me feel really good when I had hair, when I felt pretty, when I was thinner, when I, my life wasn't, you know, so terrible? Wearing a dress. I've been watching this show called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon, and I highly, highly recommend it. It's phenomenal. <laughs> She dresses up amazing. Beautiful. You never see her out of like perfection. The shoes and the dress and the hat and the purse. And even though that's not my tendency because I tend to be very comfort oriented, it's so nice. I've, only, I've almost been motivated to like get redressed in my dresses again by watching her and she's a comedian. So she goes to these nasty, dirty clubs, and she wears this black cocktail dress every time she goes on stage with pearls. Doesn't match, but it's doing something for her. She, in her psyche, feels dressed up, and that simple thing can make a client make so many other changes. So we can't minimize these small little things. We really can't. This is the impact that we have with our clients. That we say one thing, that we teach them one story, that we give them one homework assignment, and that can change someone's life. Because how hard is it to hear major, big things? They feel monumental. But we can all put our shoes on backwards. We can all put our left shoe on before our right shoe. That is something doable. And if the client feels that it's something they can do, we've made a huge impact. Brushing your teeth with your left hand, if you're a right. I'm trying to write with the that, opposite hand. Yeah, trying to write with the opposite with hand. With the shoes, those, I feel like it's more of a brain. put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And then okay. when you get back to your, you know, the right shoe, it's like, damn, I feel so much better. It's like, okay. damn, I'm being so... Like, 
uncomfortable and now it's like yes like i appreciate that they're put on right that's that's what okay to my perfect mind. and that's a shift that we can have with clients so don't think that these things are so monumental because i see that when we do role play it's like, oh my God, I have to get to the zero to seven, or I have to get to the narrative, and I have to get to the myth that you're living in the story that they're living. You know, that comes. 